The views expressed on the Final Straw Radio do not necessarily reflect those of Asheville FM, Friends of Community Radio, or any of the affiliate radio stations airing the show. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Also, if you are interested in rebroadcasting any episode or segment of this show, you are free to do so. Just send us an email so that we know you're out there. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw, Care of Asheville FM, 864 Haywood Road, Asheville, North Carolina, 28806. The show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. This week we feature a discussion among anti-racist and anti-fascist organizers who helped counter a white power demonstration rally at the steps of the California State Capitol in Sacramento on June 26th. At this, a few dozen members of Traditionalist Workers' Party, Golden State Skinheads, and other racist and white nationalist organizations were evicted by some 400 anti-racists despite police protection. As a result, the alt-right scum became stabby and hospitalized nine folks, primarily targeting people of color, trans, and queer individuals. You can help raise money for their medical needs at https colon colon, https colon slash slash rally dot org slash June 26th. Due to time constraints, we couldn't air the whole conversation. To hear about 15 minutes more of the conversation, check out our podcast post up at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. But first, here is an announcement from itsgoingdown.org. Inmates at Holman in Alabama took over a dorm on August 1st, setting fires and initially resisting the CERT team which was brought in to suppress the uprising. At this time, it remains unclear if the revolt has been completely put down or if it is continuing. Mainstream media reports that guards have restored order, but rebels on the inside have yet to describe the entire scene. The revolt began when several prisoners and at least one CO were injured in an altercation which led to this most recent riot. As the altercation moved from fight to riot, a barricade was set up as the CERT team arrived. The barricade was put into place in the sea dorm, which houses 114 prisoners. Power and water were shut off after the dorm was taken and the entire prison was put on lockdown. According to media reports, the revolt began around 3 p.m. and lasted for about six hours when CERT team officials entered back into the dorm without incident. As stated prior, it remains to be seen if this was or is the actual case. Prisoners through various channels with outside anarchist rebels and members of support organizations are calling for news of this resistance to be spread. This is only the most recent in a series of rebellions at the prison, and it will not be the last. Those outside the prison walls are encouraged to get in touch with prisoners and get organized to support them. In March of this year, the facility erupted in several rounds of riots and and the stabbing of a warden as inmates set fire to guard towers and took over dorm areas. The riot took place over the period of several days and brought a spotlight to the horrible conditions in the facility and also the growing radical movement of prisoners to organize against their conditions, which includes groups such as the Free Alabama Movement. This latest riot also occurs against a backdrop of the fast-approaching general strike of prisoners across the U.S. on September 9th. On that day, prisoners have stated that they will strike against prison slavery under the 13th Amendment. Prisoners can legally be worked for free or next to nothing. This unpaid work generates massive profits for multinational corporations and the U.S. government and military. Prisoners are vowing to shut down prison facilities and refuse to work, as support organizations on the outside have vowed to act in solidarity. For more information about this strike and for ideas about how to get involved, you can visit the website supportprisonerresistance.noblogs.org and search for September 9th. Let's return to the topic of slavery from a previous segment. We have this cultural mythology in the U.S. that the Civil War abolished slavery. 
as previously presented, this abolition didn't include the end of wage slavery that continues today. But apart from that, it also really didn't end the practice of chattel slavery that was employed in the southern states by plantation owners. At the end of the Civil War, the 13th Amendment was ratified. Contrary to our cultural narrative, this amendment did not abolish slavery. Here's what the 13th Amendment says. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, I want to read that one more time with an emphasis on what I think are the important points. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. A reading of the 13th Amendment makes clear that the United States did not abolish slavery. What they did, they took the right to own slaves away from the private sector and monopolized the right to reduce citizens to slaves exclusively to the state, the government. From the time of the ratification of the 13th Amendment until today, the process for stripping people of citizenship and reducing them to slaves is under the operation of government courts. If a court employs its processes and determines you have committed a crime, that determination has the legal power to transform you into a slave. And again, just to clarify, it's irrelevant if you committed a crime or not. The 13th Amendment says nothing about whether you committed a crime. All that has to happen is that the government's courts declare that you did. Upon such a decree, you're a slave. Now, this is important to consider for purposes of understanding the legal ramifications of this. That, in one analysis, you're dealing with the cosmic and magical transformation of what used to be a citizen into a slave. But also consider that at the same time, you're dealing with the legal transformation of a person into property. Keep in mind, in American legalese, personhood is a legal definition. Remember, in court cases, slaves were defined as being a certain fraction of a person, like three-fifths or something. Someone of the status as a slave is no longer a person under the law, but is instead chattel or property. So under authority of the 13th Amendment, when a judge thumps a gavel and finds you guilty of a crime, the court is turning you from a citizen to a slave and from a person into property. You are owned by the state. You become little more than a coffee table or a lampstand a piece of furniture to be moved and used and disposed of as the state sees fit. If we view the justice and corrections process through this legal lens, we see the true designs of the entire framework. Criminal courts are slave factories. They turn citizens into slaves, people into property, and so-called correction facilities are really modern-day plantations. Through this lens, we see why prisoners have no rights. Prisoners are slaves, not citizens property, not people. In the view of the hierarchs and their legal framework, as prisoners we cease to exist as human beings. We are chattel, like cows or sheep. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. Ironic, but when I figured that out, it suddenly made sense that when you seek to challenge confinement through remedies like habeas corpus, you file a suit against the warden the same way a slave would challenge enslavement through a writ filed against the slave's owner. In the here and now, the prison is the plantation, the warden is the slave owner, and the prisoners are slaves. Taken together, this means all of us are confronted by a sprawling slaveocracy, one where each of us is facing the constant precarity of being permanently stripped of our own personhood and reduced to chattel by an ever-growing, ever-centralizing control state actively rolling back even the illusion of protections it once may have offered. The United States is consciously and deliberately in the slavery business. I can think of no better argument for its non-existence. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from Warren Correctional in Lebanon, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at Sean Swain two four three hyphen two zero five Warren C I PO Box one twenty fifty seven eighty seven State Route sixty three Lebanon Ohio forty five zero three six For updates on his situation, his bid for US president in twenty sixteen 
And more writings by Sean can be found at seanswain.org. On June 26, 2016, about 400 people converged at the Sacramento State Capitol to prevent a fascist white nationalist rally from taking place. Many individuals and groups, including Sacramento Antifa and Bay Area Antifa, were involved in the effort. The Traditionalist Workers' Party, or TWP, and their co-conspirators, the Golden State Skinheads, were not able to hold their rally and were quickly rebuffed each time any of them attempted to take the Capitol steps. They were heavily outnumbered and resorted to stabbing protesters as it became clear that they could not win by brute force. Unfortunately, nine anti-fascist protesters required hospitalization, including several who were stabbed. We are here on the final straw to discuss the organizing efforts that went into the mobilization against the Traditionalist Workers' Party. Thank you, Chris, Thomas, and Jay for joining the show. All right, so uh, the first question I wanted to ask was, um, you know, just what drew so many people to being a part of of this on June 26th and, uh, you know, like collectively, like what drew so many people out and also, you know, why uh, did you as individuals feel the need to go out there? Um, I think as far as collectively, I think that we were definitely drawn by a need to keep this community safe by this encroaching threat of white supremacists that are known to be violent and hateful. And as well as just a collective outrage that our state institutions would allow these people to come and speak as a platform on the state capitol. And I think for myself, it really just came from a place of really realizing that I needed to take a stand against this. Uh, hey, this is Thomas. Um, I, I agree. Um, personally, um, I, I feel like if if it comes to my knowledge that there is a um, white supremacist rally, a neo-Nazi rally in my town, um, I would love to be a part of the organization, to, uh, of the organizing effort to um, to oppose that, to, to counter it, um, and whatever that might look like. Um, on that note, um, I felt like I could bring some experience because. I had been a part of some of the um, um, organizing of the counter demonstrations in the past of uh, countering the neo-Nazi rallies uh, on the state capitol. Um, so definitely wanted to be able to lend that. Um, and uh, I, and then as far as like, in my opinion, why I why I thought um, so many people responded to the call and what drew so many people there, I feel like there's something so you know visceral about being able to um, face um, you know the white supremacists um, in you know where where they're right in front of you. You know, I'm, I feel like a lot of stances we take. Um, can end up being, you know, where we're facing an institution or we're facing something that's more of like a symbol of the impression. And here it is. Here, here are the individuals who are a, a wing of the white supremacist structure and we can actually face them head on, um, whatever, and whatever that may look like. Uh, if it, if it is simply just a, a protest or a rally or, or if it's something more, um, uh, you know, some, something something more forceful, um, or something more aggressive than than that. But but either way, there they are, right in front of us, and we can do something about it. Um, so that's why I think so many people came out, and and that's and that's why. And, and then what I brought up earlier is what brought me there. Yeah, I'll say too. One of the things um, I know, we're definitely people as far as uh, this is Chris, um, who showed up because it was a widespread call that was really well publicized and there was time to do that um, just because of the ways that information about the rally, um, the TWP organized rally had gotten out. Um, but I think another aspect of that is that while white supremacy is part of the world that we live in, there was something very particular to the way that this rally was being called and who it was being called by. Um, and it really represented a move in threat um, from how we've really seen like neo Nazis or like the GSS work in the past, where instead of it, where it was something that they were collectively doing to target um, Antifa, it was built as an anti Antifa rally. So 
with that, there's kind of this consolidated threat where you have like the intellectual alt right people who are really trying to like make white nationalism a lot more palatable um, alongside these really traditional neo Nazis who, you know, have like pretty extensive histories of violence and those partnering together, which changes the kinds of things that we're up against. And especially seeing this partnership, I think a lot of people were like, oh, f no, we can't with that. Um, and for me, I, I'm like a, my experience is not with Antifa stuff. Um, it's with a lot more kind of like anarchy stuff that's happened in the Bay. Um, but it just felt like this shouldn't be something, this is a struggle that goes beyond uh, Antifa or fighting the fascist head on. It's also about white supremacy and the ground that it's gaining. Um, and I wanted to be there to push against that as much as possible and also support people who are doing direct Antifa stuff in the area. Yeah, I think I'd like to add that, yeah, I think I definitely agree with what you said about uh, people coming out. I think that a lot of the reason that people came out was because they really had a horse in his race, you know, like uh, these white supremacists do pose an actual threat to them and, you know, they feel like they need to respond because if they don't, you know, what will happen? All right, so, um, you know, in a mobilization like this, I think a lot of people hear about the clashes and, you know, the brawl that essentially broke out between anti-racists and uh, TWP supporters. Um, but what other kinds of work went into preparing uh, for this? And, you know, we'll talk about what happened, you know, after and, like, you know, the post-action roles and support for people who got injured, but just in terms of, like, uh, preparation before the event. And yeah, as far as outreach goes, that is definitely uh, something that I definitely helped to organize a little bit. There was, I think, uh, I think one of the biggest defining factors of outreach is just the varying types of people and the, the amount of different people that were creating their own flyers, that were sharing their resources, that were really trying to reach out to each and every community that would be affected by these white supremacists and each and any, every community that would want to take a stand against them. And there was a lot of flyering and postering and canvassing at a huge variety of different events months leading up to the 26th, and definitely a huge base of people trying to spread the word. Um, and, and wouldn't you agree that it was, it was like a, a really... A, a you know, I know, I know, I know, you know. You touched on the fact that like a lot of different different groups were were participating in, in making flyers and getting flyers out there. But wouldn't you agree that uh, it was a very communicative, coordinated effort um, with, with within with, within Northern California um, to to make sure that um, if if this if this area was already being postered, then 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 this other group may, may be um, head, heading into another area of being postered, and then if these groups in other parts of the West Coast were already being Getting in, get in touch with, and this other group was going to get in touch with these other groups in, uh, in a different part of the West Coast. And sooner or later, we realized that everybody from San Diego all the way up to Seattle um, knew that we that we were trying to make this more of a West Coast convergence than just a Northern California convergence on Sacramento. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of communication in between groups, and a lot of just awareness of which audiences would be interested and how to best connect them. And um, definitely just a lot of communication about trying to bring everyone together in unity, in defense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I mean... Looking, looking, looking back on on the on the prep. I mean, it was actually it was, it's really exciting to think about how how many people were involved and how communicative and and, co and coordinated people people became pretty pretty quickly and when when working together and making sure there was there there was a lot of promotion. Um, so this is this is Thomas again. Um, I stepped into um, the uh, support committee. Um, and we wanted to, we wanted to make sure we were we were covering um, a bit of ground um, beforehand, so we could be better prepared if there are arrests 
or 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 serious injuries um, on the twenty sixth. Um, so we so we laid down some groundwork of 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 getting in touch with a couple lawyers ahead of time, um, getting in touch with the NLG, making sure there was going to be legal observers um, there that day. Um, and we were kind of starting to like think of it more about um, what has happened at some of these um, anti 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 Nazi rallies uh, already. You know, just this year, and there, and we were thinking back on the one that had happened in um, in Anaheim, California, where um, two individuals w- uh, were stabbed by members of the KKK, and so we were, so we really wanted to make sure, you know, in a normal convert, well, I shouldn't say normal necessarily, but in you know traditionally in, with these convergences, we're doing a lot of preparation for possible arrests, and now with, the, with these kinds of situations, it seems like not only do we need to do that, we also need to make sure we're we're, we're preparing possibly for. Um, for serious injuries as, as well. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, some of, some of the other preparation, we, we, we really wanted to make sure we had, we had a good, solid, comprehensive, uh, know your rights flyer that had the legal line that had other like useful information too of, um, because as we mentioned before, a lot of people were responding to the call. A lot of people were responding to postering. And so, so we wanted to make sure that everyone got a, a flyer that would basically go over some sort of, uh, do's and don'ts, um, if you are detained and, and if, and if you are, uh, or, or if you are arrested, um, um, and actually, um, feel like feel like we, we did a pretty pretty good job with a, a two sided full page full page flyer. Um, originally printed out three hundred, uh, went went through those, and unfortunately there was a copy shop close by. Um, printed off another fifty, and then handed all of those out. Um, it turned out that there was a final count of of closer to four hundred. Um, so clearly not everybody got one, but we but we I feel like we did a really good job in. Tr- Making sure that most everyone got one. Oh, got one of those flyers. Um, I think that's all I mentioned right now for the um, for for as far as the uh, the support committee goes and, and our preparation. But uh, um, but 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 yeah, you know, pretty 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 excited about what 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 you know what, what came together. And I think I think there's there's always um, things things we, we we can learn and do better in the future as well. Yeah, I want to amp the communicativeness of uh, this organizing effort. It was really, I think a lot of people have brought in a lot of experience from other events in their areas or other ways of working together that they've done. Um, And it was, I felt like communication as far as organizing went was loose enough to allow for people to make their own decisions about what they were doing, where their strengths were, where they wanted to plug in, what was possible for them and what they would like to be possible in those moments. Um... And I felt like just seeing that, especially on that day, how that organizing translated to like people working together as a collective, but also making individual decisions and individual small group decisions in that moment, in the moments when things were happening, um, was something I really appreciated. So personally, I was involved with medic prep. Uh, luckily, in the area, we have a long history of medics. Unfortunately, they've been needed. For the medic side of things, there was a medics organizing training that was held before. And similar to what you were just saying, um, we had to plan for a range of what our, of where our experiences, in the, especially from the Bay, from this area, translated to a situation where we knew there were going to be a ton of police, up to you know what we all know about Nazis, which is that they stab people. Um, And there was a lot of discussion, especially in medics trainings and medic preparation, around things like blunt force trauma. Um, In the past, even at rallies that were somewhat similar to this, the police have really held a line. Um, The police have been the aggressors, even in some situations. I'm thinking of things in the Midwest more than people who are, like, out there as white nationalists, skinheads, uh, neo-Nazis, whatever. And the cops have really typically aggressed against the people who are protesting those kinds of demonstrations. So we knew, we got information in advance uh, that this was going to be an incredibly heavily policed event and had to do a lot of preparation just thinking through blunt force trauma, what supplies we'd need, but he had to go as far as thinking about like how in specific situations are we going to deal with the fact that there may be stab wounds. Um, 
And that involved a lot of planning on pretty uh, somewhat short notice of just getting everything together. There's a bunch of supplies and things that need to be bought. And also a lot of discussions of how, as medics, we would identify ourselves in that space. Um, because we know from previous things that have happened, especially around Occupy, um, that medics are really likely to be targeted by the police because they're people who help keep the people going. Um, so it's important to think of ways that you're going to like be identifiable to the people you're with without that information leaking out to the cops, or in this case, to the Nazis. Um, and we did find a way to identify ourselves around that and a way to approach people in the situation where it's really high tension. You know, that was a lot of the skills that we practiced. Um, anticipating a high tension situation in which we have to run up to people who are already injured without further intimidating them and getting them worked up and also working in teams as medics to ensure that people's safety was upheld so that we could have a lookout while we were doing what we needed to do. That's medic prep. I'm just going to um, add something real quick because you know you're, it just reminded me of uh, when you when you were talking about the, um, uh, the the knowledge of a large police presence. Uh, kind of remind me of you know um, part of my answer to the last question of um, being a part of some of the um, uh, organizing efforts against Nazi rallies on the um, at the Capitol and being able to borrow from that from the past, but at the same time, um, all, you, you can only do, you can only do that so much you can you can only um take from past experiences so much and then from that you also need to try and sort of prepare for worst case scenarios and and kind of envision what that could look like and try to do your best and and prepare for and prepare for that um and and, and again i i, th I think um I, th I think we all did a really great job but i think we can also probably um learn a lot for the for the for the future you know during during times of reflection as well so the media was really quick to demonize um, you know, counter-protesters, anti-racist counter-protesters who took part in the action. And I was wondering what y'all uh, think about this and, you know, what does this demonization point to, you know, what is it that they're trying to whitewash and why do you think it is that they're doing that? Yeah, this is something we've been talking about a lot, so I'm just going to kind of run through... Uh, some main points from conversations that we've been having about this, and then if y'all want to throw in after that, that's perfect. Sure, sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the first things that comes up with this is the media response could be viewed as this direct counter and desire to control um, the narrative of all of these visibly black and brown people who were there on June 26th. Which, and just to like erase all of these multiple generations that were present, and that people from a variety of political perspectives came together to address a real and ongoing threat. You know, like, this is something that directly af will affect people individually and collectively as we're moving forward. Um, and then, I mean, on top of that, it's like the demonization of people against the planned Nazi demonstration is deeply, I mean, like, this is what I'm trying to say, it's just super racialized. And it allows the media to maintain this dominant narrative of power that totally fits with white supremacy. Um, in the past, you know, the media has consistently taken power from militant revolutionary acts and movements among POC folks. And if you add to that this narrative that we've seen in the media of it being uncivilized people who attacked the Nazis, which also kind of suggests that the Nazis are the civilized party in what happened on June 26th, um, you know, that narrative of being civilized, of being uncivilized, whatever, that's straight from eugenics movements. Um, and it's being used in all of these liberal circles to talk about, like, the violent people who were against the Nazis rather than the Nazis as violent. And we just, I just feel like it's, like, a deeply racialized thing that's happening and a deeply racist thing. Um, and we've seen that, too, like, the liberal narratives of nonviolence on social media that are being passed around, the calls for peace, which even we see, I think, now that we can say this, because this has been a little while, like, in the wake of Dallas, too, so we see, like, that's not only something that happened post-Sacramento, but is a narrative that will be called for over and over, and that we're going to need to be able to respond to. But it just really seems like that narrative of calls for peace is kind of, like, bolstering and making room for this emboldened narrative of white nationalism and white supremacy. 
But that's not always the case. That's not always what we're seeing. And in fact, some of the media outlets right after June 26 tried to, like, really, really tried to provide platforms to the TWP and to broadcast their views, even though it was, like, obvious in the news, especially local news in Sacramento, that multiple people had been stabbed by Nazis that were affiliated with the TWP. <laughs> um, there's one reporter in particular that I will try not to call out too hard right there. <laughs> um, on top of that, the media was super, super slow to even, like, admit that there were white nationalists that had been present on the Capitol, and they used a lot of air quotes, right, or a lot of print quotes, so it was, like, alleged white supremacists, alleged Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, and then we saw that, like, as I was following a bunch of this media stuff for a lot of reasons, that kind of started to shift, but it wasn't... It didn't shift because of the fact that, like, there were visible f***ing Nazis in visible f***ing Nazi regalia. <laughs> um, you know, they like, were, They done, were literally yeah. sig heiling on the Capitol yeah. steps. <laughs> um, it changed instead of that. Like, you can see a photo of them doing that it is out there the media was using it mm -hmm. um instead of that it changed because southern poverty law center had listed twp as a white supremacist group and so we saw the newspaper starting to incorporate these southern poverty law center statements like you need an official body to tell you somebody's a nazi when you can look at them and they're like an obvious in nazi and so then we kind of saw that that narrative shift and i want to say there are times in the media where that never really happened where there weren't these, like, alleged quotes going on. But it was really, really apparent in reporting directly following the event, especially in Sacramento News. And that's an area where we know, because they were there, that there are neo-Nazis. I don't know. And on top of that, and just, like, in relation to this, whatever, so I'm kind of talking for a while about it, we just talked a lot. There's this, something we have to acknowledge in talking about June 26th, is, you know, there's been, especially over the last few years, all of this stuff coming out about the alt-right and the rebranding of the Nazis. And that's one of the big things that TWP is about, that it's platforms that are, are about. And it's this deep psychic warfare. And so for the mm -hmm. media to whitewash what is happening, to use these air quotes, these print quotes, whatever, around what it was, is and for them to give platforms to white nationalists until, thankfully, Twitter shut them down and... The, yeah, the, the Hembach article didn't, or the interview didn't air. Is that right? Mm, it was taken down. Yeah. That's part of the normalization of blatant racism, is what I'd say, that we're seeing. And it really, like, supports this idea that the intellectualism turn among the alt-right is going to be successful in gaining more and more people to those positions, which is f***ing scary. So, yeah, one last thing I'll say about this is that this media response and some of the other responses have also completely ignored or disregarded the fact that when this was originally called by white nationalists, this rally that they were having on the Capitol, mm -hmm. it was an anti-Antifa mm -hmm. demo. And instead, they've claimed that the white nationalists organized around their right to free speech, um, which is just not the case. Like, if you go back and look at the ways that they were building it, it was all anti-Antifa we had discussions like, is this a trap? <laughs> you know, like, are we being baited? Mm -hmm. These kinds of things uh, for a while before as organization was taking place. Um, and kind of what this is indicative of is like the fact that they can just do an anti-Antifa call out and the media doesn't even pick that up. Sorry if you don't like curses. Is that apparently in this moment that we are in, white nationalists don't even need a reason you know, a justification mm -hmm. for the fact that they want to rally to come together to make a physical presence and can openly make threats without that ever being addressed or acknowledged. So that's what that's my big spiel. No, thanks so much for adding so much to that. I, I'm, I'm just um, I'm just going to you know kind of continue with with two more thoughts, um, especially piggybacking on, on the, the last thing you said, where in the past uh, there was a neo-Nazi rally in 2012, and then there was a neo-Nazi rally in 2013, and they seemed to feel like they had they needed much more of a um of like of a reason to have a rally um in instead of just we, we are white supremacists and that will be our platform um whereas 2012 they were um 
um, suggesting that there is a white genocide in South Africa um, and they were the South Africa project. And so that's what their signage said. That's what their banners said. And that's what they that, and that's what they were talking about on the megaphone. And then 2013, it was much more simple, simply a anti-immigration rally. And um, again, that's what their signage was talking about and banners. And that's definitely what they were talking about over the megaphone. But now it seems like we are living in a, in a much different climate where um, groups like the KKK are going to rally in Anaheim and then uh, these neo-Nazis are, are going to organize and, and sack um, and don't seem to need a front, you know, um, seem like they're going to get the backing to um, buy more legitimate um sort of structures to be able to um, position themselves from. And I want to say real quick, like just, just kind of uh, bring it back to like a, to sort of like a, uh, kind of a simpler concept of just I feel like you know the mainstream outlets you know represent the the white supremacist structure um, so it benefits them to to whitewash it um, especially when you think about 400 people um, you know charging through the capital making sure um, that these white supremacists do not have um, do not have a voice and do not have a platform and and so what does that represent like those those 400 people that represents a, that represents a threat to that structure to that white supremacist structure and and if the these mainstream media outlets are benefiting from the that structure then oh no you know um all of a sudden there's a there's a real threat to it if there's uh if there's 400 people who are very serious about about making sure these um these white supremacists are being going to be denied that and then just one more thing i want to add um is I'm just going to go ahead and say that I'm going to use this opportunity to say that I appreciate, and and maybe if that's not already obvious, um, uh, outlets like this, uh, the final straw. Um, you know, um, you, you know, like you are, uh, you know, important in 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 giving us the, uh, the correct avenue to to take in in um, in, in getting getting this uh, getting these ideas out there. Thank you. So. You know, many people will say things like, oh, going after the Klan or going after neo-Nazis is sort of, you know, bottom of the barrel activity. Like, it's, it's sort of really easy to, like, you know, to think that these people are bad and for us to organize around them. But maybe it's not what we should prioritize. Um, and I'd like to know how uh, y'all would respond to this sort of criticism. Um, well, I think, first of all, it definitely is not very hard to mobilize people against neo-Nazis. And I think that the reason for that is very clearly that neo-Nazis represent a form of extremism that is very dangerous and destructive to uh, society. And I think that a lot of people, fortunately, do understand that. So I would say that... Um, yeah, the idea that something being so easy to mobilize makes it bottom of the barrel activity in and of itself is a big misconception. Because I think a lot of the time what that really can mean is that it's easy to mobilize these people because the thing that we're against is really just that bad. I think there's also a misconception of white supremacy and white nationalism as separate from rather than a key part of other systems of oppression. I feel like there's this idea that white nationalism and white supremacy is this crazy, like, extreme that you don't often see when really it lives among us each and every day. And I think it's really important for us to be able to, um, to be able to identify that and really realize where that, where that stems from. And, um, I think that, uh, responding to the fact that maybe people don't think that this is a worthy cause, that definitely, uh, that definitely invalidates the very real fact that these people are dangerous mm. and they're willing to do extreme things for these disgusting beliefs that they have, you know? These white supremacists were fully willing to come out to the Capitol fully armed and to stab members of a protest in front of police and then just walk away. These people are... Um, they're definitely not something that we can take lightly. We need to take them very seriously because they do pose a serious threat. And the people that they pose a serious threat to are often minorities and people that already find themselves to be targets and already find themselves to be vulnerable. So I think that makes it doubly important that we take it a serious threat because there needs to be, uh, there needs to be protection for these people that are targets. 
Yeah, I'll just add real quick that I mean I, I, I I'm a little confused as, as what the alternative would be. Would, would the alternative just to be just try to ignore them? I mean I mean as um, uh, as, as Jay pointed out, I mean, um, you know, the, these these are individuals who have clearly um, announced themselves as as individuals who who will carry out these threats, and they'll do it at pro, uh, you know uh, in the face of protesting, or or they'll or they'll do it on, on, on their own. Um, and and we need to, we need to show them that um, there is a large number of people who are not going to stand for it anymore. Yeah, and I think also there's a thing, like, or to me, there's an element to people saying that that doesn't really recognize, like we saw on June 26th, how many black and brown and other POC folks were there really, you know, standing up for their lives and um, how many trans and queer people were there standing up for their lives in the face of people who wanted them dead, just overall. Um to say that that, to make that insignificant to me is, is actually just really dangerous. It's a really dangerous conversation for us to engage in because it doesn't recognize the lived realities of people who are involved in fights against white nationalism, individually and collectively. Yeah. That and also people that are exposed to white nationalism and, you know, maybe aren't seeking out to oppose it, but these white nationalists and these white supremacists, they still will target these people simply because of who they are. So, you know, after the the melee, there were essentially nine people who were fairly seriously injured, including people who were stabbed by the Nazis. And, you know, there have been maybe a couple people out there uh, who have made statements that Perhaps the mobilization wasn't worth it uh, because so many people were injured. Um, and I'd like to hear from y'all, you know, how you would respond to that uh, that sort of claim. Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I think you know making making a statement like that is is actually disrespectful to those who were injured. Um, it's it's denying the idea that there are individuals out there who are willing to um, put their lives on the on the line, put their safety, put their freedom on the on the line. Um, I mean, um, mass mobilizations happen. Um, you know, uh, protesting. You know, demos happen all the time, um, and people understand that. that they're risking arrest, risk, risking injury, and it's because what they're standing up for is is just that is just that important. Um, uh, we have a lot of reasons to believe that specific individuals were attacked and want to recognize the agency and positions of those who were directly attacked by Nazis. Uh, these were largely black men and trans women, uh, people who have the most to lose in their day-to-day lives and showed courage and, and knowledge of the situation. Um, there, will, there will always um, potentially be, be, be injuries, um, you know, and I guess, like, like, I was saying, like I was saying before, you know, when we know what we're up against, um, and, you know, and, you know, when we're thinking about in this in a large-scale way, when, when we're um, opposing oppression... Um, or when we're talking about like these these specific, uh, in, you know, individual, you know, um, protests or convergences, um, let's see. Um, focusing on the perceived inadequacies of those uh, present at June 26 focuses the lens away from the fact that it was the Nazis who caused this harm directly and and with intent. Um, and and I, I think that's that, that, that that's really important to to, to make note of. Um, and and it's and I think it's important also to kind of um, think about like again the, the climate that we're in right now. Um, I mean this this isn't this isn't the first time that um, Nazis have 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 attacked um, uh, individuals in, engaged in uh, anti-racist anti-Nazi protesting just within the last 24 months um, or even or even a shorter time time span than that even uh, right in Sacramento about two months earlier than um, than the uh, June 26 conversion. Um, there was uh, hundreds of flyers found in the Midtown area of Sacramento. Um, the, the flyers were were very descriptive about how the uh, so the, the language within the flyer was was stating that it's time for. Um, 
Muslim individuals and Latino individuals to be disposed of. Uh, that's that's disgusting and it's awful to hear, but it's what the flyers um, said, and they even went as far as to say as um, you, the reader of the flyer, should be finding a dump site um, for these individuals. So that's the that's that's the climate we're living in, um, and so when so when we know what we're up against, and we're still willing to to stand firm and um, and uh, take those risks, I, th- I think it's again you know to kind of circle right back to where I started. I, th- I think, I think it's, uh, it's, it's disrespectful to, to those who were injured, hospitalized and, 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 um, and, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably, um, end up talking about this a little later, but if it wasn't for, for, for some of the medics on site, um, some of those individuals would have died. Um, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a reality. Um, and even, and even those who once, once, once they got to the hospital, were really fighting for their lives. Um, and, and I think it's important to recognize that, 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 that people are going to make sacrifices and it's just that important to all, to all of us who engage in, who engage in struggle for a, for a better society or for a new society. And from the side, from the medics, I'll tack on that, that we're thinking through these things as we're. As situations where injuries might happen, where people need to be able to make their decisions, and part of why the medics are there is to treat any injuries that happen, but also to provide reassurance that people are going to receive care for the risks that they want and the decisions that they make, you know? Um, And that's why I think things like medic and legal are such essential parts of organizing any kind of event like this. I definitely agree with that sentiment. I think there's always ways that we can learn from events like this and do better next time as far as keeping people as safe as possible and minimizing risks of these type of things. But when it really comes down to it, we are up against a violent opposing force that has it in their mind to do whatever it takes, basically, to get their way. Here's more of Chris, Thomas, and Jay as they speak about the alt-right media coverage of the fighting on June 26th. Street medic and other prepping before the fact and keeping safer while bashing the fash. For information on how to support those injured at resisting the racists, check out sacprisonersupport.wordpress.com and search anti-Nazi. So in terms of people who were injured uh, on June 26th, uh, can you all talk a little bit about uh, the support uh, those folks are receiving? Yeah, I'd say um, the... Or I guess the thing I'd like to put forward first is that the organizational structures um, that we already discussed that went into planning June 26th really supported um, and provided a backbone for the ongoing post-mobilization efforts um, as far as staying networked with the groups of people who knew people who were injured, um, keeping lawyers in touch with people who needed them, and doing general care, and I think some of that stuff's going to come up in a minute. Um, that was something about this mobilization that I thought about a lot, is how much communication really set the ground for this not being something that we all, although I don't think we could have anyway, um, but it really not being something that we all walked into and walked away from after it was done. Yeah, I agree completely with that. I mean, it, it, it wasn't just... Um, you know, okay, now it's going to be focused on just the support committee to um, to support those who are, who are who are now in the hospital. It was clearly, you know, okay, maybe maybe the support committee is doing a lot of the coordination around that. But there was there were there was there was people coming from different directions who who are who are a part of the original organizing effort, um, uh, plugging in periodically and 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 actually definitely um, playing playing a huge part in the moving 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 that along moving moving that, that support effort along um, post-mobilization. Um, so like I was talking about before of, you know, um, when, when, when planning these types of things, um, you know, you, you, never, you never know exactly um, how many arrests there will be, how many injuries there will be, or if there'll be any. And so now, once the sort of dust started to settle, um, Sunday afternoon, June 26, it was, uh, well, um, actually, there's nobody in jail, but there's nine people um, who are at some hospital in the Sacramento area. We need to, we need to figure out who they are and what hospitals um, they're, they're at. Um, and that took some effort. Um, 
and but that was a priority um, um, by uh, by, by those of us who are sort of coordinating that, and then by, by those by, by the by the others who are who are supporting that and 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 being a part of it as well, um, and then I'll just sort of honestly um, jump ahead to once we were there at the hospital, making sure we were providing. Um, emotional support, um, legal support, and and then you know um, overall solidarity with with with, with the individuals who were, who were attacked on June 26. Um, we wanted to make sure we 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 got to visit each one of the patients um, as quickly as possible, so we could let them know that there were um, lawyers who had already volunteered themselves to um, to be their lawyer um, at least in this very beginning stage. So when when the Cops would come and um, and visit them. They could then go ahead and turn them away by by stating their um, uh, their, their 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 right to remain silent and and then direct any questions that the cops would have um, to their to their lawyer. We would make sure that we that, that they had the phone number and the, and the full name of the lawyer. In fact, most of the hospital rooms had these dry erase boards that we could actually write the the name of the lawyer and and then the phone number on it. Um, and and even because a lot of the uh, patients were be- becoming sedated or just not in their um maybe not in their best condition we would actually even then write on a piece of paper um and we would literally spell it out of um you know i'm i'm going to exercise my right to remain silent any questions you have should be directed to my lawyer and then then they could even just point at that dry erase board. Um, so, so, so that was really important to us. The other thing that was important to us was was to actually. Um respect the institution of, of the hospital um, and to know that we were always running the risk of being of, 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 of being kicked out of there if our if our support group ever ever grew to a large enough uh, number or if or if we just didn't respect their rules enough or their uh, their policies enough um, you know even even if certain situations are, came, came you know came about that we need to address right away we need to understand that there are Parameters that we need to sort of fit in to be able to do what what, what um, what's what's needed to do in, in order to, um, to to show these individual support. Um, so within those parameters, certain things would pop up. For example, um, right away we found out that um, one of the patients, um, about a few days into their their uh, their hospital stint, um, uh, was being. Um, I don't know if care is the right word in this situation, but was, but for lack of a better term, it was, was being cared for by a Nazi sympathizer nurse. Um, so, so sure, we could have all marched up there and, and you know, bark demands, but where would that have gotten us? So we collected ourselves in the lobby and figured out the best way to handle it, and sure enough, uh, we were able to get that nurse reassigned. Um, so that's just one example, and, there, and, there, and there's a lot of other examples. Eventually, it, we became privy that neo-Nazis online were um, making threats to the to the patients and basically saying um, along with many other things but de- but but definitely saying that they were going to quote unquote finish the job so at that point we, we realized that we needed to make sure that there was um, individuals with the patients as much as possible we also realized that we need to start offering an escort um, when um, when when the patients were were, uh, were being released from the hospital and those those escorts. Um, I mean, we were realistic with it. We we, we realized, you know, um, you know what we what we what we could handle in the situation. But we needed. We, we also realized that we needed to be able to offer something. So we wanted to offer um, an escort of as of as many people as that person was comfortable with. And it usually looked like five to seven to sometimes even even eight people walking out with 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 this person to their ride. Um, and, and you know, and each each time um, a patient was being was being you know discharged from the hospital, we, we, we offered that, and then and then always fulfilled when when it was it was met with um, uh, you know an, an interest in, in that. Um, and then I'll just 
go um, go a little further with that and say that it, it has also been, been brought to our attention that not only just the, the patients um, or, or I should say now because everyone's out you know the injured um, have been uh, targets of, of Nazis um, post June 26 but also what seems to be going on is anyone that the Nazis can get a clear picture of from the protest um, you know that, that's now another um, sort of a person of interest and that they're going to start targeting as well yeah i mean i want to start this off by saying um one if we've kind of brought this up multiple times through this uh what happened on june 26th wasn't the part of an umbrella organization Mm. and the event was planned with room for a lot of agency and autonomy um so what occurred there was a drive from a bunch of individuals who were acting collectively um and we want to be really cautious in how we think through that critically um, in making sure that we recognize the choices and decisions that people made. So that said, um, we can offer some implied information from stuff. Um, Tactical says, use good wood, self-defense, you might need it. Um, From medics, we'd say consider medics as a part of tactical. Make sure that medical supplies are funded and... Uh, specifically in instances where you can anticipate that stabbings might occur, bring quick clot or trauma packs if you can get them. Uh, those are really, really important in those kinds of situations. So, still more a little bit. Being pre- be prepared for wide-level calls like this, like that went around, that were so heavily advertised, that were pulling up and down the West Coast, um, to bring new faces and find ways to keep those new to the struggle informed. It'd be extremely useful uh, moving ahead, and there are a bunch of different variations of this, but just really, if if this is going to be the situation we keep encountering, um, to have a one-page distributed resource with basic information on legal, medical, and tactical info, just like, here's a legal number, why you need it, one sentence, bullet point down a list, because sometimes if you're at an event and the tension is high, like it was on June 26th early on, even when you get a resource, it's like, how can you pay attention? Oh my gosh, whatever is about to happen is going to happen. Um, another thing I'd say in regard to faces new and old, but especially new faces, is to remember that they might also want to be covered and bring additional masks. Um, I feel like that's a really simple step that anybody who's wearing a mask can do. If you're wearing a mask, bring an extra mask in case somebody needs it. Um, yeah, and then we'll say like stuff about just material needs, which is what a lot of the fundraiser stuff is about. Um, mm. Well, material needs were anticipated in relation to this event coming up. You know, there was a fundraiser that was set up even before... Okay, if I say that. Uh, yeah. Even before the event happened that is continuing to be the fundraiser now... The severity and num- the severity of injuries and the number of those injured by the Nazis was just like not able to be met by these initial fundraising needs, and I think a lot of that fundraiser was set up as a precaution at that time. Kind of set a foundation to sort of um, build from, and then uh, and and then now we're building from that foundation that was set up and from that sort of preemptive planning. Yeah, and I'd say like as we move forward in this struggle and in other similar struggles. Um, we're going to have to continue to consider ways to gain material support uh, so Mm -hmm. we can respond to threats and confrontations. And that's something that I'm hoping that collectively we're going to be discussing here that I think people should really be discussing in other places. We're seeing not only violence, but rises in arrest rates and all of these other consequences that are coming down as people are engaging in really intense struggle throughout the nation and throughout the world. Um, Anyway, and that said, there's a lot of ways to continue to support those from June 26th, and a lot of those are on It's Going Down. Um, what I really like about the stuff that's gone up on It's Going Down is that it includes stuff about the basic fundraiser, but also other ways to show material support, like dropping a banner, sending a card, whatever. And I feel like that's that's so much more than just being like, we need money. <laughs> um even though sometimes we need money, I guess. Real quick, I know uh, Chris brought it up earlier, but the uh, the letters and cards can keep coming. Um, so I'll just I'll just plug the PO box one more time. Uh, Sacramento Prisoner Support has has offered their PO box, so that's uh, Sacramento Prisoner Support uh, PO box one six three one two six. 
Sacramento, California, 95816. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely make sure that those, uh, those, those cards uh, uh, get to whoever that they're, they're sort of um, addressed to, geared to, or geared to. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It means a lot that you care and are paying attention, especially as we know we'll be in this together as we move ahead. To hear the complete conversation, check out filestrawradio.noblogs.org and search for June 26th Antifa. To donate to those hospitalized, visit rally.org slash June 26th. You're listening to WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. 